for the past uh, 5 classes uh, we have been talking about liquid liquid extraction where uh, you use an organic solvent or you use water itself for extracting your desired product. The desired product could be a protein or it could be a small molecule metabolite or it could be an amino acid and so on. Uh, liquid liquid extraction is a staged process that means uh, you have uh, several stages um, you can perform the extraction in one single stage or uh, you can allow it to mix separate in many several stages. Uh, we also looked at uh, the co current and the counter current approach as well as the cross current approach for uh, liquid liquid extraction um, and also we looked at uh, design of number of stages um, based on certain extraction efficiency whether it is a cross current or whether it is a uh, counter current operation or conversely um, given the number of stages how to estimate the um, extraction efficiency. Then in the previous class we looked at uh, the reverse micelle extraction which is very very important if you are extracting um, a protein or a peptide or any molecule which is very solvent sensitive that means they lose their activity in the presence of solvents. So, in such situations we use uh, a, a surfactant or a surface active agent which will partition near the um, two different distinct layers that is the water layer as well as the solvent layer. The surfactant has an interesting property it is got a hydrophobic tail as well as a polar head group. So, it partitions the polar head group goes to, to the aqueous layer and the hydrophobic tail goes to the solvent layer. So, the surfactant can be used to selectively capture the protein of interest the protein of interest um, uh, from the organic solvent. In fact, the surfactant keeps the protein of interest away from the uh, harsh solvent environment which may deactivate or denature your protein. So, what happens is there is a reverse micellar situation that happens the um, surfactant aggregates so that the polar head groups are pointing inwards um, the hydrophobic tail is outside. So, when the hydrophobic tail is outside it is in contact with your uh, solvent whereas, uh, when the polar head group is inside it captures not only your um, aqueous water molecules it ca captures also the protein and uh, so the protein is kept away from the organic solvent. This is what the aqueous two phase extraction system is um, as against a normal solvent solvent extraction. Normal solvent solvent extraction systems are generally used for small molecules whereas, we go um, use the reverse phase micellar system if you are recovering protein. In fact, that is what this particular picture tells about you have the protein in an aqueous phase and once you add the organic phase and in the presence of surfactant a reverse micelle is formed um, so the protein is inside. Um, another system which we talked about is aqueous two phase extraction that means uh, you are you are extracting your desired protein uh, from another aqueous medium using water. So, it is a very interesting situation you have two uh, both the systems the liquid systems are water. Um, so, here you used uh, um, something called a biopolymer. Um, so, the biopolymer is present in this aqueous water which is going to be extracting. So, depending upon the density of the biopolymer uh, the partition coefficient of the um, solute of interest varies. So, if I keep increasing the density of the biopolymer then the solubility of the protein of interest goes down. So, if I keep the uh, molecular weight of the biopolymer less then the solubility of the protein of interest increases. So, by manipulating the molecular weight of the um, biopolymer we can change the solubility or the partition coefficient of the protein of interest um, and also you can change the type of salt concentration of salt the pH temperature such operating conditions to modify the partition coefficient. So, in this particular aqueous system um, two phase system you are having the solvent also um, water and the protein uh, is also initially present in the water. So, for example, if you are doing carrying out a fermentation and generally the fermentations are carried out in aqueous medium in the presence of salts buffer and so on 
you may have the uh, biomass, cell debris, broken cells um, and the metabolites, uh, intracellular material present. Now, you want to selectively uh, just remove all the cell debris, cell mass, uh, biomass and so on. So, that is where you use a aqueous two phase extraction system actually. Okay. So, the interaction between the um, the bio the biopolymer and the uh, protein of interest is through non bonded interactions like uh, charge interactions, hydrogen bonding, van der Waal interaction and so on actually. Now, let us look at uh, something called costing. Ultimately, um, when we want to decide on what type of equipment to use, uh, cost plays a very, very important uh, uh, parameter or a factor. Uh, yesterday, I just introduced the concept of cost. Now, we will let us spend more time on the concept of cost. Here, before you do the costing, you need to realize something. We can modify the quantity of uh, solvent that I be use it for extraction or we can increase the number of stages. So, if you are increasing the number of stages, you are increasing the capital cost. If you are increasing the solvent amount, um, you need to think about how to recover the solvent. That means, you are increasing your operating cost. In addition, if I am going to use large amount of solvent, then my vessels should be large enough to handle those quantity of solvent actually. So, at a fixed um, solvent to feed ratio, the amount of solute that you are extracting will increase with the number of trays. So, it is obvious. So, if I keep on increasing trays, I will be able to extract more of the solute from your mother liquor, but then the cost also increases because you are increasing the number of stages. So, it depends on um, what is the value of that uh, solute which you are in extracting. If it is a bulk chemical, you do not want to have extra stages and uh, waste uh, your capital cost whereas, the cost of the solute you are extracting might not be so much, but if it is a highly value added chemical and uh, you want to extract as much as possible, then obviously, you may increase the number of uh, stages. So, you will be adding to the capital cost, but you will be making in the selling price of the total product. For a fixed uh, extraction efficiency, that means, uh, given a particular extraction efficiency, if I keep on increasing solvent amount, obviously, I will be able to reduce the number of stages. If I decrease solvent amount for a fixed extraction efficiency, I need to put in more stages, it is obvious. right? So, if I am going to have more solvent amount, obviously, the capacity of the equipment also has to be very, very large for handling that. And uh, if I am having more solvent amount, the product is in a very diluted form. So, solvent removal cost needs to be included. So, the distillation column has to be larger, maybe the steam amount of steam required to distill out the material also increases. So, the operating cost, utility cost they all go up. So, you see that you need to again balance between do I put in more stages or do I have more quantity of solvent with less stages. So, again there is a balance. Um, this is a typical mix uh, settler if you remember uh, very early about 4 or 5 classes back we talked about where you have a, a tank where you are mixing your feed and the solvent. Uh, so, that means you have an agitator and you have a big tank. So, the quantity of the um, solvent you are handling the quantity of the feed you are handling will um, determine the size of your mixer. Now, if you look at the settler this is another tank where you are not mixing. Um, using an agitator. So, the two phases separate out. So, you take out the solvent phase and you take out the heavy phase. So, that is the settler part. So, each mixer settler is like one single stage. So, if you are going to have 4 or 5 mix settlers to achieve 4 or 5 stages, it is not very efficient because you will be occupying a lot of space. Uh, so, on the contrary, you may go to a column type of uh, liquid liquid extraction if you are talking about multiple stages, the advantage here is um, you do not have a mechanical agitation, you will be occupying less floor space because it is like a column. So, we can use it for heavy solvent, we can use it for light solvent. If you remember this uh, particular figure uh, from 4 classes back, we can use uh, this is a counter current system both for a heavy solvent as well as for the light solvent. Here in the case 
of heavy solvent, the solvent will be flowing from top to bottom, whereas in the case of light solvent, you will be having the solvent flowing from bottom to top. So, each uh, type of equipment will have different type of capital cost, different type of operating cost and so on. So, let us spend some time little bit on the costing part. If you look at column type uh, extractor, it is uh, not only the purchase cost of the column, but it always include the installation cost. The installation cost like uh, I have been telling many times will depend upon um, preparing your land, erecting uh, your structure, having electrical connections, having water connections, having ins insulations. So, all these will add up to installation cost. So, a capital cost will include both. You are, you are making the column operational. So, that is what you are doing in this particular case. So, a capital cost um, will depend upon for the column, will depend upon a parameter called M and S. We will talk about this parameter. M and S is nothing but Marshall and Swift equipment cost index um, and it is a function of the diameter of the column, it is a function of the height of the column and also something called the cost factor. This cost factor will depend upon many parameters, the pressure that means the pressure you are operating and the material of construction of the internals, uh, the type of internals you are using and so on. So, this uh, particular formula was taken from a book called uh, Douglas conceptual design of chemical processes, it is a 1988 book. Um, now, the Marshall and Swift equipment cost index, let us spend little bit time on that. So, this uh, cost index uh, in the 1926 it is taken as 100 and then the cost for different time periods were calculated. For example, the M and S cost index for the year 2001 is 1093 and for 2006 it is uh, 1353. So, in 1926 it was 100 and in 2006 it is taken as 1353. Okay. So, that includes things like inflation, purchasing power and so on actually. So, where do we use this number? Okay, look at this example. Suppose, I have some idea about a cost of a vessel in the year 2001, it was 15,000. Now, somebody is asking you what will be the approximate cost of that in 2006. What do you do? You go to the um, some chemical process industry data sheet or database, get the M and S uh, equipment cost index for the 2001, which is uh, 1093, and for 2006, it is uh, 1353. Uh, the current the 2001 price is 15,000. So, 15,000 into 1353 divided by 1093 will give you. 18,565. So, approximately the equipment will cost in the year 2006 18,565 dollars if it costed 15,000 dollars in 2001. So, this is where we use the M and S equipment cost index understand. So, we can use it for calculating the current price if you know the current M and S index based on a world price if you know the M and S index for that particular year. Uh, many chemical engineering and process uh, engineering data sheets or books keep giving the M and S values for quarters. So, we can be more accurate. So, quarterly changes are also happening. So, the base for M and S is that in the year 1926, the cost index is taken as 100. Now, there is another equation which is relating the cost versus the size of the equipment. For example, if I know the cost of an equipment um, cost A whose size is known size A and I want to find the cost of an another equipment larger equipment that is size B, what will be the cost? So, this is the particular formula where cost B is equal to cost A multiplied by size b by size a raised to the power n. n is an exponent that is called the size exponent and it varies between 0.3 to 1.72 for different uh, type of equipment. If it is agitator, you have different n value, if it is a tank, it is different and so on. I mean, there is a table, I will show you the table. So, where do you use this? For example, I know the cost of a 2000 gallon vessel and I say it costs about uh, 15000 dollars. I want to know the cost 
of the vessel, a 5000 gallon vessel, what will be the cost? You understand? A 2000 gallon vessel cost is known, that is 50,000 dollars. Now, I want to know the cost of a 5000 gallon vessel. So, what do I do? 15,000 is the cost of the smaller vessel, then size of the larger vessel is 5000, size of the small vessel is 2000 raised to the power n. In this particular case, n is taken as 0 0.68, n for simple vessel is 0.68. So, when you calculate, you get 27,970. That means, a cost of a 5000 gallon vessel, almost similar vessel is 27. 1970 if the cost of a 2000 gallon vessel is 15000. So, with these two formulae we can do lot of uh, equipment calculation which, uh, which is good enough for a first order approximation. That means, there could be almost uh, 20 percent uh, uh, difference plus or minus variation, but it is good enough for us to make some decisions actually. Now, I said this n value varies between 0.3 to 1.72. So, depending upon the type of equipment there are again tables available which tells you what n to select. For example, if it is an agitator, propeller type of agitator n is 0.5, if it is a turbine type it is 0.3, if it is a compressor it is 0 0.6, 0 0.7, if it is boiler you see it is about uh, 0.5, centrifuge it is going much higher than 1, 1.72 if it is a horizontal basket centrifuge. For conveyor belts you take values between 0 0.65 to 0 0.85, dryer you go down to 0 0.45 that is drum type of dryer, collectors dust collectors you have some values, um, evaporators you have some values like 0 0.7, filters 0 0.6, 0 0.5 and so on, pumps you have 0 0.6, tanks about 0 0.6, again vessels 0 0.5 and so on. So, you see that there are data available. Um, which will give you a, some value for n and we can use that n in our equation to calculate the uh, cost of an equipment uh, which is larger than the original smaller equipment whose cost is known. So, we can use uh, that particular equation to calculate cost of equipment. So, see cost some first order approximate costs could be obtained using these uh, very simple formulae. Now, a column extractor will also have internals right, we can have a packing, it may have trays, it may have different type of material inside. So, we need to consider that also. So, you need to consider uh, that in this particular using this particular equation. Again you have m and s divided by 280, diameter of the column, height of the column and some you have the correction factor. So, the correction factor will be a function of spacing, inter type of internal, type of material of construction of the internal. You may have a stainless steel, you may have a, a mild steel, you may have carbon steel, so depending upon that. So, the total capital cost will be capital cost of the column plus the capital cost of the internals. Then we include all the installation cost. So, this gives you some idea about how to do a costing for a column type of uh, extractor. Now, there is something called annualized capital cost. Okay. Annualized capital cost, okay, I buy an equipment today, the equipment may last uh, say 10 years. So, the total cost divided by 10 will give me the annualized cost. That means, the cost is distributed over that period of n. Now, n varies depending upon the type of equipment. So, some chemical process equipments may last uh, 5 years, some may last 10 years, some may last 15 years. So, you can annualize it by dividing with that corresponding number. For example, even if you take a, a laptop for example, it may last for 3 years or 4 years or 5 years okay, maximum 5 years. So, we can divide by that particular number. Whereas, if you take a, a reactor, it may last for 10 to 12 years. If you take a um, a, a simple ordinary vessel without agitation, it may last for 20 years, buildings may last for 20 to 25 years. So, the denominator will vary depending upon the life of that particular um, equipment. Okay. Now, the operating cost will involve electricity, 
labor, uh, utilities like water, steam, chilled water um, and so on actually. So, all these needs to be considered in the operating cost. Now, there is something called maintenance also, you need to consider that, because uh, every year you need to want, um, change some moving parts, you may have to change some uh, brushes, you may have to change some gaskets, you may have to oil the equipment, uh, you may have to take care of the wear and tear of some of the moving parts and so on. So, generally we may consider 3 percent of the total capital cost as a maintenance. Okay. So, even that needs to be added to calculate the total annualized cost. So, you see so many factors come into picture, you need to consider the um, actual equipment cost, the cost of the internals, then cost of uh, making it operational and then when you divide by the total life of the equipment that will give you analyzed cost, then we need to consider the maintenance cost. Now, here I am talking that the maintenance cost will be 3 percent of the capital cost, but it can vary, um, it can become 5 percent or it can be even 10 percent depending upon the complexity of the equipment and so on actually. Let us go to mixer settler, where you have uh, mixing taking place in a vessel, that means um, there is an agitator there in the mixer um, and then after the thorough mixing, they are transferred to a vessel where they are allowed to stay put and the two phases get separated. So, in a mixer settler, you can have a carbon steel mixer settler, mostly we use very cheap material for mixer settler unless you are worried about the um, the type of material which is going to affect your final product actually. So, in a mixer settler you have to consider labor, maintenance, explosion proof motor, because if you are talking about a solvent which are highly vaporizing, you need to consider the motor, then there is a drive, piping, concrete, steel, instruments, electrical, insulation, painting. So, all these factors need to be included when you are making your capital cost. So, again in mixer settler we can have a reference cost, reference capacity, desired cap capacity, the exponent formula which I talked about and again there is a M and S coming into Marshall and uh, Swift uh, index coming into picture. So, we can uh, have formulae like this raised to the power 0.7, um, because if you are just talking about a simple tank with an agitator uh, in the mixer settler, then we can use the exponent as 0.7 here. Okay. Again uh, you can use this simple formula for calculating the cost depending upon the capacity of the mixer settler. If you go to an extractor, centrifugal extractor, then generally we use a 316 stainless steel. So, it is slightly expensive, then it is going to have flexible connections, explosion proof motor, again uh, you are handling solvents means vaporization of the solvent, uh, explosion proof needs to be considered. Then uh, you will need a variable speed driver, because the centrifuge uh, RPM may be uh, manipulatable. Then you have the instrumentation, you have the pumps, you have the labor, maintenance and so on. So, again uh, you can have a formula like this. Here you notice the exponent is 0.58, again you have the Marshall and Swift uh, capital cost index term coming in here. So, depending upon the capacity um, of your mix, uh, continuous centrifuge. Uh, you can calculate the capital cost using this formula. Here the capacity is assumed as mega gallon per year. So, you see a lot of uh, numbers here, these are all based on the, um, uh, the indices, various indices uh, which are used in chemical process industries. So, you see we talked about uh, several simple formulae which can be used to calculate the cost of uh, different uh, equipments that are going to be used in liquid liquid extraction. The basic type of equipments are mixer settlers, column type of extractors or centrifugal type of extractors. Okay. Now, so far we talked quite a lot about uh, uh, the liquid extraction in the past 5 to 6 classes, uh, wide ranging uh, liquid liquid extraction techniques. Um, the issues related to the liquid liquid extraction, the solvent uh, usage, the type of solvents 
and the conditions for the solvents and then we looked at aqueous uh, type of extraction and then we looked at uh, the costing factors, the various factors that add up to the cost and uh, whatever costing we talked about, it is not a very detailed um, accurate costing, but it is more like a 25 percent uh, error plus or minus 25 percent error costing. So, that is good enough to make uh, um, certain selections, but if you are interested uh, to get a detailed uh, costing, then you need to spend more effort and spend uh, more uh, um, time to actually do those costings. Now, having done that, now let us move to the next uh, topic that is the membrane. So, membrane is a very, very important downstream technique which is used for removing large solids, medium solids, micron size solids, liquids, broths, salts, dead cell mass, cell debris and so on. So, membrane has become extremely ubiquitous um, in downstream processing for a wide range of uh, chemicals, solids, biomass and so on actually. So, it is used in reactions, you can have a membrane bioreactors, membrane reactors, it is used in clarification that means, we can use it for um, separating out uh, emulsions and frothy material. It is used in recovery, where you are trying to recover products of your interest, just a, a salt, mono salt from a large uh, mixture of several salts. It can be used uh, for removing uh, water from ethanol, you want to purify ethanol to 100 percent. It can be used for uh, getting potable water from a waste water. So, membranes are used everywhere nowadays and uh, it has become extremely useful for separating a wide range of chemicals, solids and uh, cell debris. Membranes can be made very selective, there can be membranes which are uh, selective for only water, there are membranes which are selective for solvents. That means, you can have hydrophilic membranes, you can have hydrophobic membranes. You can have very large surface area per unit volume, uh, so we can have very good separation efficiencies. We can also have a good contact and also a good mixing between various phases. So, these are the main advantages of membranes. So, it is, they are suited for biological molecules, uh, because the separation can be done in ambient conditions. So, the biological molecules do not lose uh, their activity. So, the membranes can be operated at low temperatures and uh, ranging from vacuum right up to 40, 50 bar pressure, especially the reverse osmosis membranes are operated at very, very large pressure, where we can desalinate uh, um, salt water that means, your uh, marine water into potable water. In fact, uh, um, uh, countries like uh, Saudi Arabia um, use reverse osmosis membrane for preparing drinking water for the population from brackish marine salt water, because they do not have any bore wells where they will get pure drinking water. There are no phase changes, generally there are no phase changes in membrane process. That means, uh, if you have a liquid and a solid and you are removing the solid from the liquid, there is no phase change. You are not adding chemicals to it. So, that means, you do not have to worry about uh, whether the additives you are adding is going to affect your protein or biomolecule or peptide. So, there is not going to be any denaturization or they are not going to have any deactivation or degradation of the biological process. That is why membranes are very, very useful. So, what is a membrane? Membrane is a polymeric material, it could be a biopolymeric, it could be a synthetic polymeric, it could have combination of both, sometimes some inorganic material is also added uh, for strengthening or increasing selectivity and then it is used for separating out these 
various solid liquid or liquid liquid phases. So, they are always a thin barrier you do not have very very thick membranes generally you have thin membranes. So, what is the driving force in a membrane? It could be a concentration based driving force, it could be a pressure based driving force, it could be that is vacuum based, it could be uh, a vapor, um, uh, vapor uh, pressure based uh, driving force, it could be based on electrical charges. So, there are so many different driving forces um, which can be used for separating out different material and that is the advantage. For example, in uh, electrodialysis where uh, um, it is also called the artificial kidney where patient people who have a kidney failure where uh, the kidney does not help in separating out the uh, salts and the urine from the normal blood. They use membranes um, where they use a certain electrical charge driving electrical driving force for removing the salts from the blood. So, that the blood which contains urea and other salts um, is purified. So, the artificial kidney has membranes and um, they separate out the salts ions from the blood. So, that the blood gets converted into purified blood. So, it does the job of a kidney. There are several types of membrane processes. You have uh, microfiltration, nanofiltration, ultrafiltration, then we have the reverse osmosis, then we have the dialysis and the electrodialysis, then we have the perboperation. So, a large number of uh, membrane processes and they have become industrially important and many of these which I am talking about in this slide are already being practiced in a very large industrial scale. So, they are it is not an academic exercise, but it is being practiced in commercial settings. So, microfiltration, ultrafiltration. So, you are purifying aqueous streams. So, you can use it for uh, removal of uh, unwanted solids or you can use it for concentrating. That means, you have a very, very thin liquid, you are removing a large amount of uh, liquid so that you are concentrating the slurry. You can use it for recovery of valuable products. So, all these are done in microfiltration and ultrafiltration. Look at reverse osmosis. We can remove minerals, we can remove monovalent cations and anions and so you make potable drinking water pure from anions and cations. We can remove bacteria, we can remove all the biological contaminants using reverse osmosis. Electrodialysis, we can use it for concentration or removal of dissolved ions. So, we can remove ions which are charged by applying large electric force or electric field. Gas separations, we can use membranes for separating gases. We can remove unwanted gases from wanted gases by using selective membranes. Pervoperation, we, we can use it for concentrating liquid mixtures. Suppose, we have ethanol water, I want to concentrate ethanol to 100 percent, then I can use a pervoperation. Normally, ethanol water, we cannot purify ethanol to 100 percent by distillation, because ethanol water forms an aseotrope. So, at that aseotrope, further purification or removal of water from ethanol is not possible. So, in that situation, what do we do? Either you add another solvent which will break the aseotrope, so that you can purify ethanol, but that has got disadvantage, because you are adding another solvent which may be contaminating your system or which is also adding to the cost. So, here we use something called perv operation. So, we can use uh, membranes which are um, uh, hydrophilic, so the water alone can be just removed from ethanol, so the ethanol can be concentrated to 100 percent. So, perv operation is used in such situation. Sometimes you want to concentrate fruit juices, you do not want to heat it because fruit juice will lose its uh, flavor, texture, color, so there you use perv operation. So, such situations pervoperation has become very, very useful. Ultrafiltration. So, where do you use ultrafiltration? So, we can use it 
for liquids and low molecular weight dissolved species, um, colloid particles, macromolecules, they can be rejected or captured. So, here the driving force is the pressure. So, it is almost like a normal filter. So, there are holes um, uh, molecules or salts which are larger than the holes get rejected only the liquid goes through. Dialysis, there are membranes where again low molecular weight solids and ion pass through in dialysis membrane where colloidal particles solutes with molecular weight larger than 1000 are rejected. So, dialysis works on concentration difference across the membrane. So, you have large concentration in one side, you have low concentration in another side. So, the solute travels from the large concentration down to the low concentration. Then comes electrodialysis, this happens because of a voltage difference. So, you are applying a voltage, so cations will go to the cathode, anions will go to the anode, so that way ions get separated. So, the here the driving force is electrical field, whereas in dialysis the driving force is the concentration gradient. Reverse osmosis, this can be used for dissolved and suspended material which will get re rejected. So, you will get pure 100 percent pure water on the other side, it is good for preparing drinking water um, that means, uh, you can completely remove all the salts present in the water. So, here the driving force is uh, you are applying a pressure larger than the osmotic pressure, so that the water moves from a higher concentration to the lower concentration. For gas liquid separations, again uh, you may have unequal rates of transport through a non porous membrane. That means, if there are two gases, one gas may have a higher rate of transport in a non porous membrane because of a solution and diffusion that means, one gas diffuses faster whereas, other ga gas diffuses slower. So, the faster gas which is diffusing will be getting concentrated on the other side of the membrane. So, the gas liquid separation is not based on uh, pores, but it is based on uh, diffusion phenomena. Per operation the feed in the liquid phase will become vaporized, they will permeate and they get captured or uh, collected on the other side where you have low air pressure or the sub atmospheric pressure in the vapor phase. So, the feed liquid gets vaporized and the vapor selectively gets uh, permeating through the membrane material and goes to the other side as a vapor. So, here again you do not have um, pores in the membrane, but the movement of the solute is through diffusion. Then you can also have liquid membranes which can uh, collect solutes of interest inside the liquid membrane. So, there are so many different types of membrane uh, techniques available and each technique operates on different principle. It could be a concentration gradient, it could be a pressure gradient, it could be a um, osmotic pressure, it could be a ionic forces. Uh, it could be a, a large uh, elect, uh, electromotive force applied, it could be because of the rate at which certain material diffuses through and all because of all these reasons you can get a separation. And generally as I said membranes are thin material, um, it could be hydrophilic or hydrophobic in nature. So, all the processes in the membrane separation happens because of uh, separation by equilibrium distribution or separation because of the transport rates. That means, uh, one travels faster when compared to the other uh, substance. So, that is the transport and the other one is because of the equilibrium separations. Okay. There are several models available for studying the membrane process, but two important models I will discuss little bit in detail. One is called the capillary flow model and the other is called the solution diffusion model. So, most of the membrane processes could be 
clubbed under this concept capillary flow model another is the solution diffusion model. Okay. Capillary flow as the name implies you have a loose microporous material inside the liquid feed flows through these pores. So, larger particle that means particle of about uh, 10 angstroms are held back and uh, the solution or the solvent flows through the uh, pores in a tortuous way and if there are particles which are very very small they travel with the solvent material. So, it is like a filtering mechanism. So, the solvent moves through the micro pores through a viscous flow solute molecules pass through the pores and carried by the solvent whereas, larger molecules get retained because of the size. So, that is called the capillary flow model. The next model is called the solution diffusion model. So, here what happens the molecules dissolves and the transportation through the membrane is because of the molecular diffusion and it is obeying the fixed law of diffusion. So, here the driving force is the concentration. So, he in this model it is assumed that the membrane is thick or tight or non porous there are no pores here the material transport happens because of a dissolution of the solute and transportation because of the diffusion. So, the rate of diffusion of these solutes determine um, the separation efficiency. So, this type of model is very very good for explaining reverse osmosis even per operation whereas, the capillary diffusion model is very good for ultra filtration and micro filtration and so on actually. So, uh, in real life uh, you may be using either the capillary flow model that is model 1 or the solution diffusion model to understand the process of separation very simple. So, if you look at reverse osmosis mostly you will have diffusion mechanism taking place whereas, if you take a micro filtration or ultra filtration you will be having capillary flow taking place. So, the chemical nature structure of the molecule all these will come uh, important in a diffusion process. So, in a reverse osmosis all these will play a very very important role the size of the molecule, um, the diffusion coefficient of the molecule, rate of diffusion all these will play a important role. So, in that particular situation we will use the diffusion model not the capillary flow model. Okay. There is something very very important that happens uh, in a membrane process that is called the concentration polarization. What happens is you have many species inside uh, the, the original uh, mother liquor and uh, as the li liquid flows perpendicular to the membrane you will have the solvent and uh, liquid that is diffusing through um, and the solute molecules which are very very small will pass through the membrane. So, there are material which do not pass through will start accumulating on the upstream of the membrane. So, these co its concentration keeps increasing and gradually the membrane surface becomes highly concentrated with the solutes which do not pass through the membrane. So, there is going to be a difference in the rate of uh, transport of various species and um, when we consider the bulk concentration of the species vis a vis the concentration of the species near the upstream of the membrane surface uh, there is going to be lot of difference in this concentration and that is called the concentration polarization. Because of concentration polarization the rate of filtration also keeps going down because initially whatever concentration of the solute in the bulk as well as the concentration of the solute near the upstream of the membrane will be almost same. But as you keep uh, uh, doing performing the filtration process as the um, solute molecules get accumulated on the upstream the concentration near the upstream of the membrane is going to be much higher than the bulk. So, 
the rate of filtration or the efficiency of the filtration is going to go down. This is what is called the concentration polarization and this is shown pictorially. For example, we have the vapor or the fluid flowing through the membrane material perpendicularly. So, whatever is there on the upstream that is called the retentate and whatever is on the downstream that is called the permeate. Okay. There is always going to be a boundary layer. So, the concentration of the species in the bulk is C B, concentration of the species near the upstream side near the membrane will be much higher and that is called C S and C S is going to be much larger than C B. So, this is going to prevent the movement of C the species itself. Now, this accumulation of the solute near the upstream surface is called the concentration polarization and uh, that depends also on several parameters like the properties of the solute, um, the viscosity of the solvent, the boundary layer that is formed and so on actually. So, concentration polarization reduces the flux through the membrane and it will affect the membrane separation characteristics. This becomes very very important in ultra filtration type situation. Okay. So, what do we do? We need to stop the entire process and again restart the whole thing. It is a reversible of course, it is not like an irreversible fouling of the membrane material, it is re reversible, but it is slowly going to slow down your um, separation process. So, if you look at again this um, the concentration in the bulk will be much lower than the concentration of the solute near the surface and uh, this concentration is going to slow down your filtration process and this is very beca be becomes very serious as you keep on doing the filtration. Now, there is something called the retention coefficient or rejection coefficient. We need to understand what uh, retention coefficient is and what is the uh, rejection coefficient is. The separate separating ability of membrane in pressure driven process like uh, micro filtration, ultra filtration, reverse ox osmosis and so on is uh, based on something called a rejection coefficient. So, rejection coefficient is nothing but concentration of the solute in the membrane surface minus concentration in the permeate divided by C m. So, obviously, rejection coefficient will always be less than 1 agreed obvious. Please note R depending upon C m, C m is the concentration of the solute in the membrane surface, but it is not the concentration in the bulk of the upstream. So, you can have another term called R dash which is the actual observed retention coefficient. Now, this R dash is based on C B that is the concentration of the permeate in the bulk phase and we just talked about the concept of uh, uh, concentration polarization and we also said C B will not be same as the concentration in the upstream very close to the membrane um, the upstream very close to the membrane concentration must be much higher than C B right. So, we have now defined two different retention coefficient or rejection coefficient one is called R other is called the R dot R dash R dash is based on what we actually observe it is based on the C B that is the concentration in the bulk minus C P that is the concentration in the permeate divided by C B. So, by combining both we can get R dash is equal to 1 minus 1 minus R C m by C B. Okay. So, now C B is the concentration in the bulk, C m is the concentration near the upstream of the membrane and um, because of concentration polarization this term is always larger than 1 understand this term is always larger than 1. If, if this term is equal to 1 what will happen? R dash will be equal to R understand this term is equal to 1. So, this will become 1 minus 1 plus R 
So, 1 and minus 1 will cancel. So, we r dash will be r, but because C m is larger than C b, r dash will be very different from r. So, you need to keep that point in mind. So, depending upon uh, the uh, concentration polarization, what the retention coefficient or rejection coefficient is actually observed will be very different from the theoretical retention coefficient or rejection coefficient. Okay. 